What's up guys, I'm Dave McConey. If you're watching this, you're obviously familiar with Joey Zatmary and his channel. My channel is the Brains and Gains podcast and Joe and I found out recently that we're only about 45 minutes away. So we got to meet up and do a collab together. Got to do some lifting, got to see some very heavy trap bar deadlifting, which was awesome. Uh, Joe and I definitely plan to meet up in the future and do some more collaborations. But check out part one of this podcast on my channel. Part two is here. Hope you guys like it. We, of course, get into a lot of details for Strongman, training for it, diet, what his plans are for the future, training with Mike Isertel, and a lot of other details. So I hope you guys enjoy both parts of the podcast and look out for more from us in the future. Do you find, like, one of the comments I made to you is that it's funny, like, so I've met, I don't know, maybe seven or eight people in, like, the fitness industry and, like, you know, a definite spectrum of people. But meeting you guys, like, you're all six to like almost 300 pounds and it's funny because like a lot of i'd made a video recently saying how height is a big factor when it comes to bodybuilding um, a lot of times people will take pictures and, and obviously we're going to post our best pictures but they'll look really big and but in person they're like five seven 160 pounds mm -hmm. so obviously being generally big helps in strongman but do you find that there are specific body types like you know, longer or shorter limb lengths or torsos or things like that that excel, or is it just about being big? Well, it really all depends first off on the competition and the level of competition. So we actually have a lot of high level lightweights here, which is pretty cool. Um, so for them, you know, it, it can benefit them to be fast because they have, they're a smaller guys. So they want to make sure that they have good speed against other guys. But at the same time, if you're a lightweight who can pull a lot of weight, like that goes really far. And obviously if you have shorter or longer arms and a deadlift, like that's going to affect your performance. So yeah. what is cool about strongman is the variety of the events and almost like you're better off to be able to kind of finish. Like I remember rich froning in one of the cross and I hate to keep bringing up cross, but I'm doing it is he, like the first event, he came like dead last. Okay. And somehow he ended up winning first place, right? Because across the board average, he started just keeping middle of the pack okay. where all these other people uh, were like dropping or they maybe they, did, well, they had a great first place finish, but then they kept, you know, yeah. being worse. So the same thing applies in Strongman where I think it's dictated on how the events favor you. Like, are you good at medleys? Are you strong? Or, or overall, are you just kind of average across the pack? But these other guys only maybe have like one attribute or, um, you know, so it all depends, but like typically for deadlifts, if you have longer arms, it's going to benefit you, or if you're just a shorter person, you don't have to pull farther or like longer. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the other thing is they don't do it often, but in some strongman events, they have a squat event, mm -hmm. and the, the heights for the squat are just wherever they are. Like we're, we're all the same height. So okay. if I'm a taller guy, I'm going to go deeper, you know, so it's going to be harder for me. Or if you're doing a wagon wheel deadlift that starts, you know, 18 inches off the ground, yeah. right? That looks different on everybody depending on your height. Now for Atlas stones, longer wingspan going to be great for Atlas stones. So I'm pretty good at Atlas stones just because uh, I'm, I'm a bigger guy and I have longer arms mm -hmm. where a shorter guy with shorter arms is going to have a hard time getting his arms around the stone. Right. Now, for perspective, when you look at like world's strongest man, their diameters are their stones. Like, so I have a world's strongest man stone on the other side of the gym. It's actually Mike Jenkins stone uh, that he trained with. And that thing is 430 pounds or 435. And I've picked up 430 pound stone, yeah. but the diameter of that stone, I can't pick up because of how big it is. Okay. So genetically, like if I were to try to compete probably with those guys, I'd yeah. be at a disadvantage because most of those guys, when you look at like Eddie Hall, who's six foot two, yeah, he's short, you know, like Relatively, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like Thor is like six seven, six eight, or whatever. Right. You know, Brian Shaw, these are big guys, so they're going to be at an advantage to those events just based off of their genetics. It's crazy to think that Eddie is considered short because I, before I knew his height, I thought maybe he was like five ten, but yeah. yeah, he's like six two. I think I mean he says I think six three. But he's still like, isn't he close to 300 pounds still? Yeah, I mean, as as as, as peak, I knew he was like 400 some pounds. Yeah. But now, yeah. So yeah, so six two, 300 height, pounds. Or my height, basically. Yeah. Plus, you know, 200 pounds or whatever. I mean, yeah, and that's I mean, like on the shorter end of the spectrum for a pro level. So it yeah. all depends, I guess, on like what are the events, what level you're competing at. Um, but that's what I think what makes it interesting is like you can have a guy who holds third place across the whole competition and wins first because right. he was just a steady competitor. Right. So those are the guys you kind of got to watch out for. And we had talked about too, like when I got into the sport, by no means was I like the strongest dude compared to any of the other guys I was competing against. Right. But I was fast and I was efficient. So like we were kind of joking around where I had an Olympic lifting background and when we had to do 
like a clean and press either with a log or an axle i started doing like jerks and mm-hmm. these guys had never seen this before yeah and in my mind i'm like i'm only doing this because i can't strict or push press this weight right which most of the other guys were doing right but the jerk was efficient it was faster for me so i was just beating them by like reps right you know um so over time i've had to just get stronger to match the competition but now i'm adding like keeping my speed and keeping those techniques i have in my back pocket which you know hopefully makes me like a more versatile and deadly athlete in the sport right 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 yeah the, the lean length is always interesting to me um as i've said probably a number of times on the podcast i'm about six one six four arm span and i think your coach here is zach mm-hmm. also like yeah. right away you mentioned like the arms and you could tell he had very long arms i think he said he's how, how much does he weigh any idea uh, 215, 220. Oh, he's that heavy? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. He's probably a little taller than me, too. He's like probably, what, 6'3 almost? Yeah, he's a pretty tall guy. Yeah. So, um, was he, he told me he had a 230 bench. I don't know if he was just trolling. No, he's being dead serious. He, he, really? He's a Della specialist. Wow. Um, the other thing about Zach is, is he was born without a heel, I'm pretty sure, or he had to get, he's either, he, no, no, he has a heel, but maybe he had to get his soleus removed. Okay. So, basically, when he walks, um, it's almost like a club foot. Wow. So I'm just telling your story, Zach. So if you're listening to this, my man, we love you. <laughs> but uh, so it, it's difficult for him to squat. And uh, with powerlifting, like he just realized that his best leverages are going to be with deadlift and his best yeah. strength. So he pulls sumo. Obviously, his arms are crazy long. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't have to worry so much about his heel with just the way his feet are. Okay. So, and he doesn't really bench at all. Like we joke around. He'll come in here and he's always hitting big bench PRs, but it's like, yeah, yeah, like 225, 240. Wow. Um, Interesting. He could be definitely like strong, but for him, it's like he just specializes in the deadlift and. That's all he does is deadlift only competitions. Oh, okay. I didn't realize he just did deadlift. Wow, that's interesting. So we just went to, you said Wayback Burger, right? Oh, yeah, Wayback Burger. Okay, yeah. I'll make sure I got it there. So uh, you got like basically three burgers. You said that was the third time you went this week, right? Yeah. So at 270, what is the nutrition like? Because we said how we're kind of surprised you actually don't eat that much total calories, 4,500 calories or so. But, and you know, for people listening, like, one of the things we said is a lot of people think that they have a really big appetite. And when I was younger, I had a much bigger appetite. But there's a huge difference between somebody who's chronically dieting and chronically trying to stay lean and thinking like, oh, I can eat so much, and somebody who's been massing for a year or two years, eating that every single day. It's totally different. So even though 4,500 isn't that much compared to what some people eat, you've been doing it for a while, right? You're still trying to, your body is probably fighting that to some degree. So how does the nutrition look? Are you starting to now have like less clean foods to get those calories in? Yeah, so that, that was my challenge is when I first got in those calories or, or the macros I was trying to hit, uh, you know, I was trying to do as cleanly as possible, right? Like I was trying to stay away from a lot of processed food and I was doing like a lot of like, you know, beef and rice or and chicken and rice, vegetables, etc. But the amount of food that you'd have to, you know, consume portion size is like just a a lot, man. So I did that for, for as long as I could, but then I just randomly hit this wall where like I was just stuffed all the time and I didn't Mm -hmm. really have an appetite. I kind of look at food and I developed like not the greatest relationship with it where I was just kind of like, yeah, man, like I don't want to eat that. But then it's counterintuitive to your goals. You're trying to put on size and then you start to see the scale dip and then that messes with your head. right? Right. So these are just like, this is just the truth of it. Um, so I, I'd done that a mass like that before. And I think also, too, when I had started my mass the previous time, I just, like, went gung-ho right off the bat. Like, I was kind of, like, that green light. And, you know, everyone says that, what do they call it, like, the the dirty bulk, yeah. right? Like, I never really ever truly did a dirty bulk. Yeah. And I almost, like, wanted to do one just to say that I did sure, it and yeah. ultimately know that I would regret doing it. Like, right. my, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like, I already just set myself check up. Check it all. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I did that, I went from, like, you know – maybe like 3,500 calories to like five or 6,000 calories. Like I went really fast and I increased it and and I hit it hard for a while, but then like I said, I hit this wall. So, you know, now going back after I hit like a maintenance phase and kind of like a little mini cut in between there, I think I went back down. I think I was at 272 is like my heaviest, but it wasn't like a good, like I didn't feel that great. Mm -hmm. So I came back down to about 260. And I stayed at 260 for a good amount of time. My body just naturally liked it there. I felt like I had got off just some some like fat, unwanted fat that I wanted. Felt a little bit more athletic. Um, but I always wanted to like get to like 275, maybe 280, uh, doing it the right way. So yeah. with this new bulk, I wanted just enough of a surplus to get you know the results. But it was going to take a, a longer time because I, I wasn't going overboard by like a thousand or 1500 calories. Just you know like 500 calories. Like keep it simple. Um, but 
you know, what I had noticed from the previous uh, one was to get these calories in, like you're gonna have to have some wiggle room with like getting in some dirtier calories, you know? Yeah. And honestly, like we were talking like way back burger, like when if you were there, like it doesn't look like these gross. Like, yeah, it's not ridiculous. Yeah, it's not ridiculous. We're like, I would say five guys, have you been to five guys? Sure, yeah. Five guys I think is a little bit yeah. more ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, their like signature thing is like, it's dripping out of the bag, yeah. right? Yeah, so. yeah, and like there's a time and place for that, but I didn't want to do that all the time. Yeah. Um, so. You know, I had to find some different alternatives, like I'll do like a pint of ice cream here and there, you know, or I'll go to the Wayback Burger. And that just allows me to get those calories in faster with without being as satiated yeah. and I can hit those goals better. Um, so for me, doing that has helped. Um, and like I put a video out before on YouTube, but like you also have to know when you are trying to gain weight like you're going to gain fat too and sure. i think mentally in my head i was like resistant to that as well i think a lot of people are yeah because we're always fighting like well we want to be big and jack but then we don't want to get fat and like lose yeah. our abs or whatever right. but it's like listen like if you want to get strong like you gotta go all in on getting yeah. strong so being in that surplus um so for me right now yeah i'm sitting about 270 i feel better uh, than I did before when I was here. Like I feel like I had a lot more water retention. I just didn't mm. like the weight just didn't feel feel right. You know right. now it feels better because I've done it slower, uh, and I've included in you know some more uh, calorically dense foods like such as like the ice cream and the Wayback Burger and, and things are going a lot better than last time. I'd be curious to see because like you know if I a lot of people it's like the first time you get up to weight and then you cut back down, you lose a lot of strength. But like when you've done it for a while you seem to be able to hold it better and i would wonder like you kind of you said you were kind of like stuck at the like the you felt like you i think maximized your potential like 242. Mm -hmm. i would wonder though if you got up to like these higher weights and like were there for a while when you eventually get back down to 242 if you'll have a much better overall you know package and lift and everything compared to if you had just stayed 242 the whole time and i think there's limits there. i don't think you going to 400 pounds would necessarily make any sense but um i and a lot of people do seem to notice that like like for instance when i cut down this past summer i was like 180 um and but i i maintained the majority of my strength that i had at like 210 um so i know you haven't done your big cut yet but it'll be interesting to see how much of that you can maintain yeah and uh kind of the same as you like a lot of people i've talked to that have done it yeah. they seem to have either maintained their strength pretty well or if there was any loss it's like super minor right and it's almost like still really respectful when you look at the percentage of weight loss compared to where their numbers are at like yeah. you know even if i got back down to you know let's just say i don't know 240 but i like an 800 pound deadlift or, or somewhere between 750 and 800 pounds like yeah to me, that's still awesome, you know? And, and like you had said, the more you do it, I think your body kind of, you know, adapts to that and like the strength that you were at yeah. uh, to preserve that as much as possible. So for me, it's like the long-term game, man. Like I want to be like jacked and healthy in my 40s and 50s. And like, I look at it like now, like I got to put that work in and set that foundation and spend some time there. So like ultimately when I get older and things do decrease or things change, I still have a really nice base, yeah. you know? So like, that's what I'm looking to do Definitely. do now. Cause it's inevitable. Like, you know, things are going to change your, your body changes, your strength changes, you get older. But I feel like the more we can hit it hard earlier on and do that as best we can. Like, I, I mean, I do think like when you look at like Brian Alzer or John Meadows, guys like that, like, yeah. dude, they, even though when I was talking to John, he said, uh, well, his incline bench was like, maybe it was like 300 pounds or something for a set of like 10 or, or 12. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And he was just like, that's pretty damn good. Right. Yeah. I was like, yeah, dude, that's I'm like, crazy. you're like almost 50. Like, yeah, that's awesome. You yeah, know? Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't where it was. I'm sure he was like in the threes at some point. Right. But like grand scheme of it was it like 10%. Like, totally. yeah. So that's the way I look at things. Um, and I definitely think when I do this cut, like I like to see where my strength is. I'll probably make a video about it. And when I'm focusing on the cut, I'm not focused on the performance. Like I think oftentimes we want it all. And it's like, if you need that goal, kind of just like I said, with the weight gain or weight loss is you have to understand that other things are going to take a hit, but don't like let that consume your brain, like sure. stick to that goal and, and get there. And I don't think it's going to be as bad as you ever thought it was with other things where it may not change at all. Yeah, I mean, a couple of comments on it. So the one is, I know for this cut, I was like, oh, well, I'm getting down to this weight regardless. Because one of the reasons that I always stopped was I just, you know, I, as I've said a number of times, like, I'm not like the biggest guy, I'm not the strongest guy, but I've put in a ton of work. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's very hard for me to accept any loss, right? And, you know, if you're, and again, obviously, it's, you know, depending on like perspective, in your world, you're not that big. But, but, 
I think to most people you're pretty huge. And so maybe if you lose a little bit, it's still like, well, I still have this identity of a really big person. For me, I'm like on that borderline of like, well, you look athletic maybe, but like I can't afford too much of a loss without just looking like, do you even lift, right? So uh, that was always hard for me, but this time I was like, oh, I'm just gonna do it. And whether it was that and I was more relaxed about it or whatever, it was one of my most successful diets. Um, and I was thinking, you you said you had like maybe like the bad relationship with food and it was the opposite, like almost, I would say 90 plus percent of people when they think of a bad relationship with food, it's like the people who are chronically dieting, they're always like really hungry, they're kind of food obsessed. And with you, it seems like it was kind of the opposite. Um, and I thought about it because you said five guys. When I was done, and this is a terrible idea that I don't recommend to anybody, <laughs> Um, I remember like a year or two ago, Eric Trexler was telling me that when he had dieted, he wrote down like a list of like restaurants he wanted to go to. And I was like, well, that could work because this way, when the food comes in my mind, I'll think about it, I'll write it down, and I'll just get it out of my head. The problem with that is that when you're done, you have a list of like 20 places <laughs> you want to go. And I literally went to all of them over the course of like four weeks or five oh, wow. weeks. I mean, it maybe wasn't, I mean, these aren't all restaurants. It was like, Five Guys was one of them. Yeah. There was like a Freddy's down the street that I had never been to a Freddy's before. So I was like, let me try that. Um, and it wasn't, from a health standpoint, it definitely wasn't good. I would basically have like a couple of low days and then this refeed. Mm. And, and that, I've been doing this for so long that I have a pretty good relationship with food and, and all that. I never get too obsessed with it. But that was definitely like, this is not what I would ever tell anybody to do. Mm-hmm. And I don't think like you're at a risk of doing that because you're not gonna get like bodybuilder lean, uh, like not that I was either, but like yeah. I'm sure you're gonna take it in a slow and controlled way. But it definitely, it, it was just, it was like fun, you know, to eat all that shit. <laughs> but it yeah. was definitely like, this is this is where that relationship with food, you start to see, like there was a, I think I've told this story on the podcast before, I almost had a period where it's, it's really interesting to see how the body responds when you're in kind of like a starvation mode. Mm-hmm. I did an absurd experiment of 1,000 calories for two weeks, and I just wanted to see what happened. And um, at the end of that, as I started to think about food, I almost felt like manic, and I'm not like prone to emotional swings really at all. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a pretty stable person. But I remember thinking about how like when I'm gonna get my refeeds and stuff, and I like I was like laughing. I was like, this is bizarre. Yeah. And it just my body was probably just like, dopamine rush. Yes, get that food. Like it was just so. That's not really that relevant. It's more just a story about yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. But it, it was a. It, I don't know. It's just interesting how the body can respond. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, we were talking about bodybuilding in general, and I've talked to people like Eric Helms, and you know he knows a lot more about that than I do about the relationships and behavior uh, with food and. Yeah, for the most part, like, I would have thought on a cut I would have gotten that way. Like, I think that's what most people think. But, you know, you have to look at the opposite way of, like, force-feeding yourself is awful. You know, like, 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 literally your body is not hungry and it doesn't want you to consume anymore. Like, our body is a a very smart mechanism that is trying to keep homeostasis. And, you know, here you are. Like you have to eat another fifteen hundred to two thousand calories, yeah. and you're like, dude, I can't do it. So, yeah. uh, you know, that automatically is going to change how you think about things or what you associate with food. And right. it's like, you know, you may eat chicken and rice to the point where you're almost going to throw up. It's like now maybe I don't want to eat chicken and rice anymore. Like I just and I see chicken and rice, I'm like, I'm good. Yeah, you know, right. so <laughs> it, it it changes in that regard. And I was, you know, and I think there's a lot to be learned from these experiences too. So for me, it was kind of like. You know, okay. Uh, here's what happened. Obviously, right? It's my own experiment. You know, and moving forward, how can I do this better? And even like with the massing and the cutting, I'm pretty sure the research shows that like they compared, uh, you know, bodybuilders who have lost the same amount of weight, but the duration was different versus yeah. like 20 weeks versus yeah. a typical like 12 week cycle, and just the way they look yeah. like is better and healthier. So for me, it's like like I said, the slow, slow and steady. You know, do it the right way, but at the same time, try to find things that are manageable. Like one of the best things for me for massing um, and being that surplus was just incorporating things like juice, like with meals. You know, mm-hmm. like a, a glass or two of juice, like fruit juice, because it's going to be high in carbohydrates and calories. Yeah. And I can get those calories down. So it's like liquid calories essentially. Yeah. But when I first did that, like I didn't do that. Okay. So it's like all those calories that I wasn't drinking going down easily had to be made up in actual physical food. Right. So like. Right. I was just finding little tricks and tactics that had helped me, um, you know, get those calories in, and, and to the best of my ability, and also not be as bad. But at the same time, being okay with like going to a Wayback Burger, getting a thing of Ben and Jerry's, not really 
like feeling in my head like this is junk food like i'm gonna die yeah you know like i'm clogging my arteries right now like so there's kind of like that moderation but i think it, it kind of becomes necessary like it's it's going to be very very much an uphill battle if you're trying to do everything uh, in terms of quote-unquote clean food yeah or we think of clean food versus trying to throw some other stuff in there yeah and it's funny now that i don't get as high in body fat i don't notice it much but like um the other podcaster I mentioned, Abel Chabai, who I feel like I mentioned on like half my podcast, and I know he's watching, so what's up, <laughs> Abel? Um, and, and he has a big appetite. He's, he's one of the people who I would say, okay, like you do have a bigger appetite than me. Like in college, my friends didn't believe how much I would eat. Like I told them, like, no, I have cheat days that are 10,000 calories, not a problem. Yeah. And they were like, no, I don't believe it until they saw it. Um, and one, I don't have the appetite I used to. Um, but two, it's I, I don't get as high in body fat. But when I was doing that, like somebody like Abel is, I think it's very easy for him to bulk. He has a huge appetite, and he he doesn't push the weights like crazy high. He gets up to maybe like two hundred pounds. But when I was pushing up towards like two twenty, it would get like you said, like kind of like nauseating. Especially when I like I remember it was a period where I was stuck at two hundred seven for a while, and I was eating like basically how I eat now, like, like specifically certain foods and very clean. And I just kind of stopped that. And then I went up to 220, like no problem. Like once you start incorporating certain foods. Um, but I mentioned to you like the keto bulk and, oh. and most people have, again, I mean, the average person just doesn't have an interest in pushing their weight that high. So trying to bulk up to like new levels at the time on keto foods will, I mean, if anybody tries that you'll see kind of like what we're talking about that there's just a point where like i don't care how much you like peanut butter or cheeseburgers like eventually you'll be like this is horrible like yeah. i want some fruit or just something like different at least you know and i think going to like the burger joints or something that's different for you um there there's certainly evidence to show that just variation leads to more consumption and so i think trying to stick to like a specific like i eat chicken broccoli rice whatever it makes it even harder yeah yeah, definitely. I I 100% uh, would agree with that. So for me, yeah, that variation uh, has been clutch. I guess the last thing I wanted to kind of like round off on was I don't know too many people. I, Strongman has improved in terms of notoriety in the last, I don't know, five years. Mm -hmm. um, you're in that world, so I think it probably seems even more prevalent to you and the people who are into it follow you and things like that. I'd say the average person still doesn't know that much about it. Um, but one of your, who was, um, there was DK and Taylor, Taylor and Taylor was saying how he had even as uh, like iron sport gym, which is like a serious gym, didn't have that much strongman stuff, right? Or it was hard to do some of the things that you can do here. Yeah. So earlier you mentioned that, well, I just had to get stronger. Do you think it makes sense to specifically be like, well, okay, if I see this stuff, I'm interested in it to say, like, I'm not even going to get involved until I've hit a certain base? Or do you think, get into it as soon as possible, it's only going to help? Yeah, uh, double-edged sword with that question, but I'm more in favor of just get involved and do it. Okay. I think what's cool about Strawman is the community, hands down. Yep. Like, I've been a part or coach or been to all the other strength boards that you can be involved with. And with Strawman, it's like you are basically competing against other people for sure, but even at a high level. Like these guys you're competing against will help you like yeah. like literally like we've had people who have just trained the majority of our shows they're the novice class which is just their first time or uh you know they just are getting into the sport and they may have done like a couple of competitions but they're and, and this is an open weight class so you have a guy who's 150 against a guy who's 300 pounds oh, wow. so it's like you can't take it too seriously because it's more just about the experience in itself sure. but you know you'll have you'll have guys who are just like yeah, I've, never, I've literally never done this or seen this. Uh, and they're about to go up and compete. Yeah. And the guys next to him is going to be like, all right, man, like, you know, if you need my straps, take my straps. Like, you definitely should strap in or here's what you should do. And, like, I've never really have seen that. Like, and yeah, it's been kind of awesome. cool. Um, and that's what I think people get hooked to is, like, people are going nuts for other people to, like, hit yeah. these PRs and, like, do well. And, yeah. they're, and they're, like, cheering each other on. And then, you know, I think it's cool because it's, like, they expect the same thing for them. So it works out for, right. for all parties. Um but I think, yeah, like relatively there are some numbers maybe you want to consider, like depending, like getting into the sport. But I don't think that should be like the limiting factor for you thinking like you can't be able to. Like maybe you zero an event. There's five events. So it's yeah. like, you know, and it's also not like the say weightlifting or powerlifting where if you miss a lift, 
you have to just go up like you know what i mean like they yeah. bump you up a kilo okay. or or whatever um it's just like nope that was scrapped i can go on to the next one and do well even if you don't finish an event you, you can get a, a measurement or points for however far you did get so okay. there, there are other options there but i think for anybody you know who's just training find a competition the other thing that's cool about strongman is you can look up all the comps yeah. and see which one suits you like at nationals they obviously make let's just say for a 275 it's a 60 second deadlift for reps the deadlift's gonna be 675 well that's national so what they're trying to do is wean out you know the right. crowd super easy yeah but at a local show you may find one that has 450 or, or 500 pounds yeah. so you know typically like since we run four shows we have one show that's basically designated for beginners okay. you know because we just want to get people in there and enjoy the experience now the other shows we have are pretty heavy but it gives them like a reference point to see like yeah. you know or just something to do like I don't want to take away people opportunities to compete and get involved with it. The people who want to go big and play big, well, we got shows for them too. Yeah. Um, but I think getting involved with it is huge. And like I said, you can see some numbers. So like generally, like having a 400 plus pound deadlift is probably going to work in your favor. You know, being able to press over 200 pounds in some sort of variation probably going to be in your favor. Um, you know, um, think of squatting. Like even though it's not really an event, like squatting 315. You know, should probably be like yeah. roughly where you're going to be around. Does that mean if you don't hit those numbers, you shouldn't compete? Heck no. If you're right. listening to anything I just said, get involved with the sport. Yeah. Um, check out what the community is about. And like I said, tons of other shows out there that can cater to different levels and just implements as well. So, like, if you're someone who sucks at certain things and doesn't want to do it, no one's telling you you have to. Yeah. Find a different show that doesn't have that involved. Mm. You know, obviously, the higher you get, the more things are going to become mandatory. Sure. But, you know, if we're talking to the regular general public, like, just sign up, see what's about. You're gonna have a blast. That's awesome, man. So, other than OnlyFans, where can people find more of your stuff? All right. So, uh, Zastrength.net is a content platform that I've created with myself and our coaches. That just we put out tons of articles to help anybody along their journey. Uh, a lot of it's strength sport related. We also have our programs available on there and just YouTube videos, podcasts, etc. So that's like the content hub. My YouTube channel is Zat Strength, S Z A T, and the word strength. That is the same as my Instagram, which is just Zat Strength. And then uh, the gym is Lions Den Elite Training. So you can look that up on Instagram and it's also just the name of the gym and it's in Colmar, PA. So if you guys ever want, come drop in. We love people coming and checking it out, taking classes or just training. Uh, so we're always having the doors open for that. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for hosting this. For sure.